All right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Happy Cow Q&A session. Um, obviously, I'm Glenn, and I think tonight we're just going to talk a little bit about, well, we've got a, quite a few questions, people asking about the business model, asking about Happy Cow, also asking about um, our crowdfunding campaign. So um, we're pretty happy with how the crowdfunding came, uh, campaign has gone so far. Um, I think, well, let me share the screen. Um, um, obviously, last time we raised uh, what the four hundred thousand dollars in uh, about eight hours, uh, and this time, well, it's taking a bit longer to get there. But you know, I'm still really pleased with where we're at, and um, uh, just so encouraged by the uh, support we're getting. And you know what I. It's really encouraging reading the um, comments that um, our investors put in. Um, you know when they when they uh, well, they pledge. So um, yeah, thank you very much to all you who have pledged already. And uh, obviously, I'd encourage you to do so if you haven't already. Um, so our, our minimum target is five hundred thousand. That's what we need to get to the next stage. And um, you know we're around a hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, dollars to go and uh, 19 days to do it in but it would be it would be a lot handier if we could get it done sooner than that anyway um, what I thought I'll do is while we wait for um, a few other people to join and a few questions to come in I'm just going to talk about uh, the happy cow business model and I want to I want to explain how it's um, how we're following this um, I suppose platform business model. You know, a lot of um, there's a lot of talk around uh, technology companies and how you regulate technology companies and the power they have and how dominant they are and how they're monopolies. And much of the um, the attributes of those companies are not that they're a technology company; it's more that they're a, a platform company. So I wanted to explain that a little bit further. A um, couple of years ago, it's a well-known quote, um, Tom Goodwin said, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. And Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And then Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no re um, real estate. And what he's really talking about here is how these platforms are businesses that coordinate assets rather than actually own the assets and um, you know this is something I've um, spent a lot of time thinking about how we build Happy Cow into becoming a um, having the most impact possible and obviously if we all know Uber it's the classic example everyone uses Uber is the platform the producer it's someone who has a car and an app and they can become a taxi driver and obviously someone with the app can become a customer um, Uber is simply the um, the platform, and the same goes for the Airbnb. Someone with a house and a computer can access a holiday maker, who's the consumer side of the platform. Um, just tell me if my kids are too noisy. They sound like they're horrifically noisy to me, but um, just post a comment uh, if I need to turn them down. Um, and then quickly, if we just look at some of the most um, major businesses are actually platforms and these are um, businesses who don't simply own the asset but they're really coordinating other people who own the assets and a quick I'm just going to labor this point a little bit just to make sure everyone understands it so a linear business is a traditional business you know they sell a, um, a product um, or a service to a customer so they take milk they process it and sell it to a customer the platform basically facilitates other people to um, process and sell the product. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, a linear business, they own one side of the uh, transaction, so they own the production side. And for us, uh, as a platform, we want to own the infrastructure that controls all sides of the platform. And for a linear business, traditional business, they really get their value from the actual product. Whereas a platform, their value is um, how many people actually use the platform. And it's the platform which is valuable, not so much the product. And so a lot of people talk about milk. And while we're a milk company and we want to make the dairy industry better, we're using this platform model in order to do it. 
Uh, by the way, just um, if you have any questions about anything to do Happy Cow, uh, just pop them in the comments um, and happy to answer them as we go along. Um, and just an example here, obviously Marriott, the, the hotel chain, they own a lot of hotels, a lot of buildings in cities all around um, the world. And um, that's their asset. Airbnb basically doesn't own any property and it enables people who own a house or, or properties to become, I suppose, mini moteliers. Um, Twitter and the New, New York Times, I suppose New York Times employs journalists and does journalism. And Twitter, anyone can basically broadcast and share um, uh, newspapers, uh, clippings and things like that. And then obviously Netflix is an interesting one because Netflix pays for the production of um, movies, series, documentaries, and then puts them on their platform where YouTube enables any participant or anyone to make their own, uh, their own videos and the platform enables people to find them. And uh, basically, this is what we're doing with Happy Cow. We're the platform that enables farmers to produce. So that's why we have our milk factory in a box, because farmers can't process milk easily uh, with the, the current technology and the current regulation. So by providing them with that box that does it automatically, they can now become a producer. We then take our dispensers and we pop those into the hands of anyone who wants to become a retailer. And now they can sell milk. So they're a participant on the platform and obviously we have customers who need milk and we facilitate the um, the payment via the app and their connection with resellers and farmers via um, our platform and that's simply how it looks basically um, every um, participant connects to the happy cow crowd um, so we have the producers that have the hub and then um, processing um, technology or the, the software that helps with the processing and then resellers, whether they're home deliveries or, or cafes or, or retailers, have a um, dispenser set up in a certain configuration. And then we have um, the app that enables customers to buy it. And that's the back end that we've really built that no one really sees. And that's databases. And uh, there's a lot of thought goes into how to structure and build those databases so that this all works seamlessly. Um, and the next question is like, well, how do we scale this? Because that's really what we're trying to do. We want to scale it. Um, for instance, if I go back, all these participants, if we set up a farmer somewhere, Happy Cow in Christchurch, Happy Cow Milk Co. shouldn't be coordinating um, the delivery of milk to cafes and retailers between the farmer and so on. The system should coordinate that and enable the, the participants of that platform to do it all themselves. So what we want to do is basically find a farmer. We start with a farmer and then we help them find a handful of resellers. So those will be cafes or schools or retailers or whatever they may be. And we'll have a system for that. So the farmer might inquire and say, hey, we love the, the sound of this. We'd like to look into it. We then send them all the marketing material they need for cafes, schools, retailers. And that will be slightly different. But and then would say to the farmer, go off and find 10 or 15 of these resellers. And that's actually pretty easy to do. Once they have those, we then go and give those resellers marketing material, videos to share, Facebook posts, all those sorts of things. And we basically attract the customers. So these are um, the people who are going to buy milk. And then once we've done that, we sort of say to the farmer, well, Here's your customers. Here's all the app downloads. They're waiting, ready for you. Here's the resellers that are ready for you. And they would um, purchase the hub and uh, they plug it into the internet. They become a node in the network and they become fully compliant um, milk processors. And obviously we have to ensure that they're um, you know, in line with happy cow values and stuff. But what we've done there is we've just set up a little mini milk community. And then what we want to do is build a moat around that community. That means we want to... We want to protect that, that little business, that farmer's business, from being um, eaten away by competitors. So we don't want someone to come in there and decide, well, she's got a great business. Uh, I think we can take those customers or, or um, undercut them or do something that is going to destroy that customer's business because, one, it means that you know our farmers are going to be 
ethical, sustainable farmers. We want them to be winning in the um, in a competitive environment. So we need to give them the um, the tools they need to win and make sure that that's defendable. So what we sort of call a happy cow mope is our ethical treatment of cows. We have to say, well, is a competitor likely to come in and treat the cows better than we do at happy cow? You know, we've got our cow and calf policy. We've got um, all, the, all sorts of other things that um, uh, that we do. And will, will a competitor be able to do it better? And I say, no, they won't. And will they have reusable packaging? Well, possibly. Um, but will it be as easy to get reusable packaging and convenient because um, that's one of the big drawbacks at the moment. Um, it's hard to buy from, um, well, it's hard to find dispensers, so we want to solve that. The next thing is f sustainable farming practices. Will a competitor have more sustainable farming practices than that farmer? I doubt it. And one of the big things is that authentic relationship between the farmer and the customer, and that's Partly why many of you are watching me now, because when I was milking cows, you um, had that relationship with me, and it's the same names that were messaging me all those years ago are still messaging me. And um, I think when we give that to all these farmers, that's so powerful because um, um, trust is really important these days. You know, you never know what's true. You don't know if someone's telling you porkies. They don't know if someone's hiding something. And we want that. Um, that sort of uh, authentic relationship and we're sort of going to build that into the app. So I think that's one of the biggest com competitive advantages is a competitor able to come into that farmer's little milk community there and steal their customers away when they have such an authentic um, relationship. And I doubt it. And the next thing, and this is a really big one I get asked a lot about, is affordable retail price. Often someone will come in and just undercut you or a business and take their customers even if they are loyal and and so on. But what if your price, milk price is quite low and they can't really undercut you? What if we've got all these ethical, sustainable practice and, and uh, attributes and we also have a relatively low milk price? It means that that's an almost impregnable fortress, I suppose, a, a really strong little business. And that's what we want to do here at Happy Cow is we want those ethical, sustainable farmers anywhere around the world to really win in a competitive environment and actually um, not rely on the goodwill of customers to only support you because it's the right thing to do. We want it to be the right thing to do, but then actually make financial sense as well. And then what we really do is then we just take that little micro milk community model and we just scale it all around the world. So we don't really mind where a farmer is. Uh, we will have a model that works for them. So if they're in the US, uh, farmer contacts us and then we roll out the same sort of process. Find your resellers, find your customers, here's the equipment and where you go. And in India and Africa and, and who, wherever. So um, by doing that, we then just are adding sustainable ethical farmers um, exponentially around the world. So from a, um, a platform perspective, once we've built the platform, once we get to about 20 farmers, that's 20,000 litres of milk a day, um, that's where we start covering our, uh, we're covering our costs. And every time we add a farmer from then on, our costs don't necessarily increase. Well, there's a marginal increase in cost, but yet our revenue increases dramatically. So this graph here is just some rough numbers. Basically, 2024, um, uh, how many farmers do we have there? We'll have a, oh, I can't even read that. Um, but the, the idea is, is that for the next two years, we basically, we don't grow very much at all. We build the model. We're building the technology. We're making sure everything is working and bulletproof. And then that 2024, we start scaling one, one farmer a month. And then in 2025, it's like, I think 25, 26, we start scaling like four farmers a month. And then as we start just cranking it on and once the system is built and working, um, the numbers start adding up. And if you look at 2027 there, 50 odd million, that's what we're sort of, um, oh yeah, 200 farmers, just over 200 farmers and Happy Cow's got 50 million in revenue. And, you know, we can build this into a really, you know, big business. And when we start throwing off cash flow, that means that we can even become more affordable or spread um, even more. So uh, that's basically 
a quick overview of why we've chosen to build Happy Cow the way we have, mainly because we want to scale. And uh, the model really uh, means that we, we, we recruit those farmers, we give them the security knowing that their business is going to work, they get the customers and the retailers first, then they outload the cash. And because the farmer is paying for all that hardware, it means Happy Cow doesn't need to keep raising money in order for us to grow because growth is really, really expensive. 70% of businesses that fail are actually growing because they run out of cash flow and uh, we've had that problem before. So we want to enable the farmer to use the, the equity they have in the land to buy the equipment. That means we're not buying it and uh, it means that we can just scale exponentially. Right, so that is there, um, let's stop that, and um, our long-time fan, um, Chris, I understand you have a patent for your system, is this defendable and guaranteed? Well, I don't think anything is guaranteed. Um, the, thing, uh, the thing with the, the patent is, if anyone is to copy our patent, or, or to, if they were to copy us, uh, it adds an extra step into the milk processing system that would mean that farmers or processors would have to um, pump milk out of the pasteurizer into another container. And that's a uh, food safety risk. And I think any competitors who are looking at wanting to copy the Happy Cow model, which is basically farmers or lay people or not expert process engineers to process milk, that extra step of handling that processed milk is probably too much for most um, food safety departments in, in corporate uh, in the corporate world. And even for me, I, uh, the reason we've designed the system the way we have, the patent basically says um, the the final packaging is also a pasteurizer. So we're saying the tank, whatever our tank is also a pasteurizer. It's like saying your milk bottle is a pasteurizer. And the reason we do that is it means that we can put raw milk into it, we seal it and then it gets pasteurized and cooled down and then they deliver the entire tank. It means there's no risk of contamination. So we have to, part of the funding for 500, the, the 500,000, a big chunk of that is actually the patent. It's probably gonna cost us around 50K to register that around select countries around the world. And you really have to decide, is it actually worth it? And I suppose at this, the least, times where you, you're short on capital and, and cash flow, it's easy to think, oh, it's not important, but maybe three years down the track, it could be the difference between, um, you know, uh, having a very successful business. And at the end of the day, I mean, if you looked at that graph I just showed before, I mean, we've got 150 million and we've got 900 farmers. So, I mean, do you know, there's 22,000 dairy farmers go out of business every year. So, you know, that 800 farmers is very, very small. So, you know, maybe it doesn't matter if we have competitors, but then again, I don't know, these are the things we sort of think about. And um, the thing is, I think over the life of a, a patent, over over um, 20 years, I think a patent costs $20 million to maintain. That's not even defend, just to maintain it. So, you know, there's some question marks whether it's a, it's a positive thing to do, and we'll probably we'll see how we go with that. But I think it is important. That's why we've invested in it so far. But thanks, Chris. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, uh, we had a Y round two of crowdfunding. Well, basically, we spent the four hundred thousand building the technology, so building the. Uh, the microprocessors that go on the tank and the and the, the the cloud database and getting the tanks made, and I think I'm I'm pretty happy with where that's gone. You know, that's it's pretty. We've done a really good job with a small amount of money. I know a lot of companies would spend easily spend a lot of a lot more than what we have. And but looking back, we sort of feel, or I sort of feel, or maybe we could have made a few better decisions. But um, I know David, who's who's been involved in a lot of design projects has sort of said 400,000 to get where we're at is, um, is doing really well. So we're crowdfunding now because we've built that and now we need to test it. So we've got the 10 tanks sitting here ready to go. They're gonna to go to Chris and he's going to send them to a boarding school, actually is the first one. And they're gonna use about 300 liters of milk a day. And uh, that's a really safe model for us 
to to work with because we don't have to activate the payment system and things and we can just run a very basic system and then we just add functionality and add an extra customer as we need to so that's that's why we're crowdfunding um, and the next question leads on what will this actually enable and well really it's it's enabling it's really enabling the purchase of more tanks. So for Chris to scale up in North Island, he needs, well, we probably need about $100,000 of, of more tanks. And um, then we're also gonna need to pay for well, people like David. Um, they have to uh, update the, you know, the housings and all sorts of things. There's a lot of stuff that's gonna need to be done, waterproofing. Um, and maybe software breaks down. Or maybe we need a, a new feature that we haven't thought about. Maybe there's a something that needs to be fixed. So we have to have some buffer in there for software engineers to come in and fix that. Um, but uh, mainly, it's to buy um, it's to buy more tanks. It's to build one more hub, and it's to pay professional people to do professional things. Because I can't. It, it, the time for me cobbling together stuff is uh, sort of well and truly over. Um, so the next one, why are shares more expensive than last time? Well, last time what was basically my plan is just a vision, which is um, credit to all of you investors who invested on my vision. I thank you very much. But um, it was a plan that said this is what we're going to do. And now we've actually built it. And we've got um, you know quite a bit of IP there. We've got quite a bit of, um, of hardware and technology built. And... Um, Oh, just about got our MPI accreditation um, and I, I think we can sort of show the value and the potential of the uh, of the business and it's really hard to figure out what what it's worth um, you know these arguments that it's too expensive these arguments that it's too cheap um, I, I suppose I take it personally that I, I need to make sure that anyone who invests is not going to uh, is, is not going to be, um, I suppose, hard done by. Part of what we had to do is issue more shares. So if we had issued shares at $1, then everyone would have been diluted and those early short shareholders would have um, essentially lost money. Um, and by having it as $3, basically everyone stays the same. Um, no one's diluted. Well, the, the share, share count is diluted, but the value of the shares is roughly the same. And I mean, that's not the reason why you value a company like that. But, um, you know, I'm pretty comfortable um, with where we've, uh, where we've valued it. And I think in five years time, if we uh, execute like we say we will, I think $3 a share is going to be really, really cheap. And um, yes, yeah, so I, um, I feel like, well, here's the question. Do you still care about calves being separated from their mothers? Yes, very much so. And I always feel like I'm just talking just becoming like an old broken record talking about cows and calves cows and calves so sometimes I for, I forget to say it because I I feel like it's it's wearing on people but we're getting a lot of questions people saying we don't hear you talking about cows and calves anymore so um, that's a good reminder to me yes very much so the, the model for happy cow is that um, cows stay with their mothers until they're weaned and you know the, the thing is is we we think animal agriculture in the future has to have impeccable animal welfare and has to be uh, open and transparent. And yeah, so we don't think that removing a calf from its mother on day one is um, a viable option going into the future. And if we want to be the most ethical, sustainable, you know, animal-based dairy company, well, that's a core part of what we do. And to, to be honest, it's causing me a lot of headaches. There's, it's, it's, there's a lot of farmers who are keen but this is causing them a little bit of hesitation. So um, in the next year, you're going to hear us talk a little bit about how we're going to work with farmers and, and um, I suppose, ease farmers into this model. Um, but it's definitely a happy cow um, uh, principle. And the next one, are you still packaging free? Well, absolutely. I mean, we don't have any packaging. We have a dispenser. So... Um, the whole model is based on a dispenser, so people have to bring their own um, their own uh, packaging, and um, yeah. So that's basically that. I'm going to 
I'm going to whip over to the um, the Pledge Me page, and there's some the questions there. Some of you may have already uh, listened to those or, or read them, but um, it might be handy. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, put them into the comments. Uh, occasionally, I'll jump onto Facebook or YouTube afterwards, and I will see a comment that hasn't popped up on the streaming software. So if I haven't asked answered your comment, it's not because I've ignored you, it's because it hasn't popped up, so I'll answer anything. Um, but if you've got any questions, please put them in there. But at the moment, I'm just going to go through um, some of the questions on the Pledgeme site. Um, hang on, let me, let me get rid of this banner. Yep, there we go. So um, way back there, we've got Peter who asked, um, Oh, also, I assume my sound is okay. Um, he says, if I understand correctly, the farmers are to buy the milk processing tanks. What is the expected cost per tank? How many tanks would be required to be purchased to achieve your financial 25 revenue target? Oh, I don't know that off my head, off the top of my head. And how does this tank connect receive milk from the existing standard milking unit? Okay, so basically, um, yes, we want farmers to buy the hardware. Um, so the number of tanks they need will depend on how much milk they want to receive. We're basically assuming uh, for every tank that you have at a retailer or a cafe, we need another three tanks and possibly four tanks. So they will be, one will be at the farm and two will be in transit or something in between. Um, oh yes, thanks for your uh, questions. Oh Marco, nice to hear from you. Um, Marco is one of our earliest investors and popped into Saltworks all those years ago. Um, I'm just going to interject when I get a new question. Uh, sorry if this is already asked. I'm a bit late to the game. Do you have any prediction when you think Happy Cow might break even, start turning a profit? So, yes, we need to get to about 20,000 litres a day. That's 20 farmers with... 50 cows each, or 20 farmers selling 1,000 litres each, or 10, 10 farmers selling 2,000 litres each, or um, or any combination of the above. So um, at that point, basically, the overheads cover, uh, well, that revenue covers all our overheads. It covers development staff and all those sorts of things. Prior to that, um, we're losing money because we're basically paying developers and, and people to write software and and stuff like that. So um, we expect to get there around year 2025. And uh, really we're going slow for this next year and then the year after are going to be quite, well, I assume they're going to be slow. Things might go really well. If the technology all works, if everything's reliable, well then we'll just crank it up. I mean, I'm, I'm all for cranking it up. But basically we're going to need to do more capital raising to get to that point. Um, Interesting, we've got, um, you know, we've got Chris in the North Island. He's got 400 cows. You know, we can sell, you know, we can we can get to a good chunk of almost a break even just with Chris, just with that one farmer uh, selling into Auckland. Um, you know, we'd have, if we had 700 cows, we would have 2% of the Auckland market. And, um, you know, that's, you know, that 700 cows is basically, you um, or close to break even for us. So, uh, if you have a have a look in the IM, it's there. But um, roughly that twenty thousand, whichever way we run the numbers, um, twenty thousand liters per day is roughly when we break even. Um, thanks, Marco. Um, Carla, um, as a dairy farmer myself, it would be nuts having one hundred and eighty calves in the herd with the cows. They will go through fences. What about non-heifer replacements? How is the farmer going to handle overstocking until weaning? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so first off, um, the typical New Zealand model is that you want to carve all your cows within a, an eight-week period or as short a carving as possible. So if that's, let's say you've got 180 cows, I would assume it's 180 calves all, built, all carving in, let's say, August. Um, and yeah, it would be a bit of a handful. Um, and yes, they do go through the fences, but the, the the model we sort of when you're selling milk to customers, you're selling milk 
365 days a year. You're not selling on a seasonal supply basis. You're not selling to Fonterra and then drying off in the winter. You probably need to supply milk in the winter or find someone else to do it. So the way I did it is I spent a couple of years getting my herd to calve evenly throughout the year. So there's only ever a couple of calves being born every month. And you've really got a handful of calves with the cows at any one time. The other thing is the reason you want to do that also is that it makes your um, milk composition um, consistent because um, a seasonal supply farm you would have um, a whole lot of milk fat at the end of the season. Um, so um, it's not as easy as just taking a typical dairy farm and just swapping it over. Um, the, to be honest, the calves do go through fences, but so what? You know, they come back again. <laughs> That's the whole thing. You, the cow calves, you tag it, and then really you don't really think about it. And they they do go through the fence. They all wander off and spend the day together, and then about 3 o'clock they come back um, and feed from their mother again. And, you know, as long as you've got a secure fence so they don't get out the gate and down the road, it's it doesn't really matter. And I know that's hard for you to understand. You probably think, oh, it's just, just chaos. Um and how's a farmer, farmer going to handle overstocking until weaning? Well, it's just eight weeks. Um, and, well, I think you just budget for it, don't you? Just It's feed budgeting. Um, and I think any extra additional cost you'll get uh, that, will, that you will incur from um, having to feed extra calves, I think you'll make it up in the extra weight that they have for selling the calves. I know Chris has got... Uh, people lining up to buy his um, his bulls because they stay with their mothers and they're, they're heavier. But I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that it's easy and that it's simple. Um, you do have to change your systems, and that's part of the, the barrier we're having from farmers is that, you know, it is a system change. But, you know, I, I think we it's a system that does need to change. Um, but thanks, um, Carla. And uh, hit me up with some rebuttal if you have them. Um, but getting back to um, these tanks from um, Peter's question, um, the number of tanks a farmer has depends on how much milk they're selling. Uh, obviously, the, the the advantage of this is you can start off small, dip your toe in the water, and then so you buy the hub, and then you buy the minimum tanks, and then as demand increases, you just add more tanks, basically, and you just do more cycles per day. Um, and uh, how does the tank connect and receive milk from the existing milking shed? So basically, um, it just fits a standard milk fitting. You attach it to the milking plant of um, the standard cow shed or a vat. It can be either or. And um, the tanks fill themselves automatically to the right level. There's a level sensor in each tank because it's quite critical that they're not overfilled or underfilled when you're processing. So what a farmer could do is hook it all up um, open up the vat and the tanks will just fill themselves to the right level. Once they're all filled, they can shut the vat off and um, and uh, start processing. Um, <clears throat> Peter also asked, uh, he's got three questions. I'm assuming, oh no, this is Steve. I'm assuming the system is heavily reliant on internet connectivity. Absolutely. Um, what precautions against cyber threats? Uh, so Sam our software developer is actually a network engineer and he's the um, he's the help desk or the, the tech guy for many ISPs around the country and he's constantly um, doing um, or anti-hacking stuff or, or locking hackers out of ISPs and stuff. So um, he basically said to us is just assume you're going to be hacked. Um, we'll put all the, all the mechanisms we can in place but assume we're going to be hacked and basically when you get hacked it means that you can just um we can just uh uh we basically have copies of all the databases and all in separate locations and you just swap to the other one um at the end of the day if someone's going to hack our dispenser they don't really get much data from it um all the important stuff is kind of locked away but um um yeah, um, I think it, uh, 
the question about internet connectivity as well. At the moment, uh, the system is built as simple as possible, meaning we want to, it just connects to the internet and it sends data up and down. If data gets disconnected for some reason, we have an error message and that's not stable enough for um, to scale up. So what one of the first things we're going to do with this new capital is actually build everything so it has an offline feature. So that means if it's processing milk and it loses connectivity, it's fine, it'll carry on processing, it'll finish and everything, and then it just uploads all that data um, afterwards. And the same will happen with our milk dispensers. If um, it loses con connectivity in the, in the supermarket or something, it'll still keep dispensing and acknowledging people's um, IDs and things from their app. And then when it regains connectivity, it just uploads all that data and, and balances out everything. Um, Steve, next question. Uh, if you're looking, if you look at our website, you will see a few pictures. Oh, no, that's me. Gosh. Oh, this question. How does the Happy Cow system differentiate itself from the vending machines already dispensing milk at the farm gate or food markets? Um, that's a good question. Like we've spent, we could have just gone and built, bought milk dispensers off the shelf. There, there are plenty of them. Um, they're quite big. Basically, they're a fridge with a tank inside and a pump and a controller. And really, the biggest problem with getting um, reusable packaging to become mainstream is you need to make it efficient and and easy for people to get it. So you need dispensers everywhere, basically. So that means we have to drop the cost of them. And these fifteen to twenty thousand dollar milk dispensers, it's you know it's a lot of money if we want to have fifteen dispensers. So we decided to build our own from scratch, build our own microcontrollers and everything. And we've built a super, super simple dispenser that oh, I should show you a photo. Um, basically, it's a tank. It's then got an ice bank next to it. The way we cool the, the milk is that we circulate ice water around the outside of the tank. Because um, when we pasteurize milk, we circulate hot water around the tank. So when it's in a cafe or a retailer, it's basically got ice water going around it. And that means that it doesn't need to sit into a big fridge. That means that you can put our tanks along the wall of a cafe or under a bench or anywhere as long as that ice bank is attached to it via a, a pipe. Um, it's, it, it keeps cool. So it means that this, this dispenser can now fit anywhere really in cafes never have any room. Um, you know, if you're in Wellington and Auckland, space is so expensive, you don't have space to waste. So we needed a system that was going to be able to fit into all sorts of different environments. So it's completely modular. You can have the ice bank in the back room, you can have the tanks in the front, and then the actual filler head, you know, the little white thing that you've seen that actually dispenses milk, that can just sit on top of a bench. And um, I suppose, so that's the thinking around why we've done our own milk dispenser and what differentiates it. Um, and by the way, I mean, our milk dispenser, I think it's going to cost around two and a half thousand. I think at the end of the day, I might be a little bit optimistic, but it's nowhere near sort of 20,000. So the hardware cost of getting dispensers into people's hands is much cheaper. And, you know, we want people to do home delivery. We want we want people to go out there and think of selling Happy Cow Milk as a as a, a great mini business. So we want to reduce the barrier of entry for them. Um, and the last question from Steve was, has the company considered the possibility of biosecurity threats, um, malicious or otherwise, vandalism of the equipment um, or groups who are against animal cruelty and stuff like that? Um, we kind of have. Uh, it's sort of a little bit down the, the list of priorities at the moment. But, I mean, if someone wants to, I suppose, contaminate our milk, they probably could. Um, it's not hard to um, put those measures in place. And um, I think if we need to, then we, we will. But um, uh, we should never say never. But, you know, you'd have to get past barista staff or, or um, supermarket staff and things like that to really, um, and you're going to have to, you'd look pretty dodgy trying to get into our tanks as well. So I'm not sure if that's a huge worry. But um, um, thanks, um, Carolyn. Makes sense. Thanks. Wish we owned our own farm. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we have a lot of share milkers who are saying they would love to be involved with this, but the farm owner won't. Um, won't agree. Um, 
Yeah, and my mother would, uh, and I would, <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I'm not, not saying it's easy, but, um, and I think we want, once we show farmers doing it and, you know, we can, we can experiment a bit more, I think we can make it easier for farmers. Um, yeah, but thanks, Carl. Um, Simon, uh, can non-residents buy a share in this round of fundraising? Oh, boy. Actually, well, no. And I said this last time that we we're going to try and get overseas people involved. Um, and <laughs> legally, it was just too difficult, basically. Um, the, the FMA in New Zealand, what's more, the, the, the financial markets authority in the different countries that are the problems. We can do it in the US, but again, you have to start registering companies in their local countries. So we'd have to have a country, a company in the US and one in Australia. And then they have to say, well, you need to have a, an actual physical office and, and then yearly reporting. And I can just think of an, you know, at this stage, we don't really have the resources to, uh, to be filing, I don't know, six different, um, uh, reports to different, um, to, to the securities commission and those sorts of things in the U S. So, Long term, Happy Cow actually wants to always get our funding from the crowd. And we'll be an international business, so it's just that um, it's probably too, still too early where I can't justify all the legal fees and everything involved with doing it. But um, it's certainly uh, we've got a lot of unhappy people uh, in Australia, the UK, and the US who have wanted to invest, and in Europe. <laughs> um, so. What we want to do is basically be able to have a, uh, a yearly crowdfunding campaign that will be spread all around the world. But to do that, there's a lot of um, backing stuff. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying no. But um, I wish you could. Thanks, son. Um, we've got a, a question here from Jeff who said, I wondered if... Um, you thought of offering farmers a low capital option where they would retain ownership of the plant on the farms and charge the farmers an infrastructure fee. Um, yes. Um, yes. There's a couple of things here. Like if we make it too easy for, well, should I say this? Maybe I will. If we make it too easy for farmers, like they can just sign up, dip their toe in the water and without having to outlay any money, um, you know, are they really committed? Um, and we kind of only want committed people. Yes, we want to grow and everything like that, but yeah, we want people who are committed. But then on the other hand, you know, there should be an option where maybe instead of the farmer receiving a dollar forty-one a litre for their milk, maybe they receive a dollar twenty until they've paid off all the equipment. Um, some sort of um, uh, system to lower the barrier. And I think that's going to play more into the smaller the farmers are, their, the, their access to capital might be more difficult. And we need to do a lot more work on this. But what we'd want to do is, let's say we're going to go to Germany, we would, we kind of know exactly what type of farmer we want in Germany and who they are. And we'd probably approach some of the banks over there. And um, banks really like it when they can give their customers an opportunity to become a lot more uh, profitable because that makes them more bankable and, and more secure for them. So we'll probably go in through a bank or something like that and um, start acquiring farmers like that way. But there's all sorts of options. And right now we just basically need to be selling milk before we can start thinking of um, all those things. But um, so many options, so many opportunities. Um, but um, oh, another one, can um, farmers also supply Fonterra in a conventional factory? And absolutely. So um, um, most of our farmers are selling, well, who have expressed interest will sell most of their milk to um, Sinlay or Fonterra. And uh, that's kind of good for us at this early stage because it means that if something goes wrong or we can't sell the milk or hardware or software breaks down, at least there's somewhere else for their milk to go. So um, it sort of removes the risk for us, it removes the risk for farmers. And um, under the Dairy Industry Restructuring Act, Fonterra um, uh, have to enable farmers to sell 20% of their milk to another competitor. Although that may be about to change. I have to reread that. But um, 
we, we certainly won't stop a farmer um, supplying someone else. Um, in fact, we would in, encourage it. But um, the way they farmed the cows that went to happy cow farmers, uh, happy cow customers would have to be in line with um, our principles. But if someone's got 500 cows and 100 cows supply happy cow, we wouldn't expect them to make the other 400 cows farm the happy cow way. And I think we're just going to be open with customers about that. And um, it's something the, the farmer can talk to their customers about. Um, well, I'm rambling on and you guys are still there, so I'll keep going. Um, if you've got questions, um, just put them down. Um, really appreciate um, you know all the support. And oh, we've got questions here from Logan. Um, um, Oh, yes, we answered that question. Um, Logan says, hi there. Do you anticipate transportation of the product to retailers to be achieved? Um, is this an ex expense incurred by the buyer or the seller? Right. Ah, yes. So at the moment, we're relying on the farmer to be the distributor. So let's say the farmer is on the outskirts of Christchurch. They would process a 1,000 litres, and then they would pop those 10 tanks onto their, their ute, and they would drive into town and do about, four deliveries and then drive home pick up the empties and drive back to the farm and we budget on about a 100 kilometer round trip and um, we budget that the farmer should employ a, a full-time person for eight hours a day to process that thousand liters and deliver it and uh, that that kind of works when you're in somewhere like Christchurch it's not going to work so well if you're going into Auckland um, if we know what Auckland traffic's like um, Chris is about an hour's drive south of, of Auckland and um, we've got a, another farmer in the north of Auckland who's about an hour's drive north. So that sort of model probably won't work. But what I think we want to do is, I talked about that platform model where we allow the participants, with the platform coordinates all the participants. So what the farmer might do is drive to a drop-off point on the outskirts of Auckland and then we would have crowd-based um, distributors to do the last um, that last mile delivery so um, there might be a little warehouse or something where the farmer drops off 10 tanks and picks up any empties are there and then we might have three or four different people who will come and grab three tanks each and take it off to a cafe or a retailer or something like that so um, we haven't built that capability yet but that's probably how it's um it's going to work but um I think we've got the model where basically anyone gets paid for the work they do. So the farmer gets paid a certain amount for producing the milk, and then there might be a certain amount for distributing the milk. There's, a, there's obviously a certain amount for um, retailing the milk as well. So the farmer can do all of those if they wanted to. You know, they could have 100 cows. They could own all or control all the dispensers, for instance, or just sell from their farm gate or whatever and do all the distribution themselves, in which case they would get almost the full retail price, or they can send it out to other people to do it. So um, anyway, um, <clears throat> well, I've lost my mouse. Here's Trevor. Uh, can you foresee customers having a choice of cow, goat, or sheep from venues, premiums for organic? Well, there's no reason. You can, we can put goat milk in this and sheep milk in it. Um, Technically, you can do all sorts of stuff. We could turn our vats into our pasteurizers could be turned into cheese vats as well. Um, so theoretically, people could order a tank and make cheese out of it. Um, I think this is interesting about the premiums for organic, and we have to think about who sets the price of the milk. And is it us at Happy Cow or is it the farmer? And maybe a farmer wants a premium for organic or or A2 or whatever they would like to promote. And I, I think it really comes down to the, wh what their local customers want. And um, and I think, yeah, we're going to play this by ear. I mean, we've got a, a price that we think works in New Zealand. And uh, we'll talk with farmers and see how we, we, we goes about it. But at the moment, we're just going to concentrate on cow milk. Um, I know a lot of sheep milk uh, sheep farmers have tried to sell sheep milk and it just doesn't seem to be something people want to drink um yeah but um there's a lot of a lot to unpack in there and um we basically need to get a couple of farmers under our belt and 
and get a bit of feedback from them. So these early farmers are really uh, testing the system. Thanks, uh, Trevor. And Shelley, oh, nice to hear from you again. How much does each tank hold? Well, our prototype tanks hold 60 litres. Uh, we chose 60 litres because it's a bit more manageable. Uh, the next lot of tanks will be 100 litres, though. We, we think that we probably have two tank sizes, um, but the bulk tank of 100 litres is probably where we'll go. So there's a bit of uh, logistics around that. How do you unload and load, excuse me, a, um, a sort of, well, 120 litre or 120 kg tank off the back of your ute? And um, David and uh, Kieran and the team are uh, working away on a, a simple system to do that. But um, there'll be... Um, the advantages of the big, a bigger tank is basically less deliveries. So um, if you can go to a cafe that uses 300 litres a, a week, which is what an average cafe uses, um, you know, deliver three tanks on a Monday and you don't need to go back until the end of the week. Um, if you have a lot of smaller tanks, you might have to do maybe two, possibly three deliveries. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do is reduce the number of deliveries because um, in my Originally, the first time around, we were selling 600 litres of milk a day and doing about 25 deliveries a day. Um, under this model, we will want to be doing 1,000 litres a day and basically doing four deliveries a day. Um, and, yeah, the bigger the tank, the better. But there's obviously a, a, a cutoff where sometimes you can have a too big a tank. But, I mean, a lot of milk dispensers overseas have a 200 litre tank. Um, so that's not... Um, it's not uh, out of the question, um, and it's quite possible we'll have, you know, multiple different sizes tank size tanks. Um, um, and carrying on with the questions here. Um, uh, where did I get to? Oh, that was more questions about how the tanks are filled. Uh, I think I answered that before. And um, oh, yeah, so oh, oh, so um, Peter was asking about whether it's going to be viable for a farmer to uh, do all these extra deliveries and everything. So I suppose it needs to be clear that if you're a dairy farmer, you've probably got a full-time job dairy farming. Uh, this is not the sort of thing that you you just uh, sort of roll up 10 minutes early before milking and set up and then go and milk your cows as normal and everything's pasteurized at the end. I mean, theoretically, it'll work like that. But, you know, milk processing, although we've simplified it a lot, you still have to be actively managing it and monitoring it. So we sort of say to farmers that um, you should employ a full-time person or a dedicated person who's going to uh, process the milk and distribute it. Or maybe it doesn't need to be the same person, but you need to add staff to it. And when, you, when you're when you a farmer, you're receiving around 50 cents a litre for your milk at the moment, and we're paying $1.41 a litre. There's, uh, you know, we've we've built in the, the labour cost and the travel cost into that. Um, and basically, if you're making... If you're selling a thousand liters a day, that's 50, 60 odd cows. You should be able to pay a full time person, you know, a decent wage, pay for all the transport costs, pay for the milk testing and that sort of stuff, and still sort of have a 100k left over it at the end of it. Um, but um, yeah, so. Um, does the farm have to do any sales, marketing, advertising? Um, I think the way it's going to work is that the the outlets will do all the advertising. I don't think we're going to have billboards all around the place or putting newspaper ads in or advertising on Facebook and stuff like that. Basically, Happy Cow will always have our social. Once we get someone who's not me doing it, we'll probably get you know some good people doing it. But really, it's about the farmer sharing what they're doing on farm and that will come through the app and it'll probably be shared through the resellers. Uh, every time you go to a dispenser, you can, uh, there's all sorts of cool stuff we can do with those dispensers, um, put screens on them and live webcams to cows and all that sort of stuff. But um, 
I, I think the the farmer relationship with a customer is going to that initial marketing when we onboard the customer, basically get their database, get their customer base together, and basically they're just going to keep keep um, trading amongst each other. I don't think there's a need to do a huge amount of marketing. When we find a new farmer in a region, basically we'll jump in there and basically um, try and get a whole lot of attention. But um, I suppose it's on a needs a need by need basis. If a farmer has more milk and they're not selling it, well then we'll probably jump in and try and help them out. But um, the thing is, when you've got happy cows, when you've got cows and calves, you've got reusable packaging, and you've got all the you know that connection with the farmer and stuff that the marketing kind of does itself like i've never spent a cent on marketing i mean marketing for us is when i've paid someone to help with um maybe graphic design or to help with um doing some social media stuff but we don't ever really promote ourselves well we're not even selling milk but um i sort of say the, the marketing department's in the paddock and um we want to or another way of saying it is um, marketing or advertising the price you pay for having an um, a, um, unremarkable product. So um, and I think Happy Cow is pretty remarkable when you see what what um, uh, what the final product is. So um, you know I think if we landed in Geelong, everyone would know about us pretty soon. Um, so and that, that that's the theory behind it. Be 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 really awesome and everyone will just hear about you word of mouth um, and there's a there's a uh, is the milk um, non homogenized uh, the individual tank stirred so yeah so the milk isn't homogenized so homogenization means that um, the the fat doesn't rise to the top it stays suspended in the milk um, we won't be doing that because it's an extra piece of equipment and it's very expensive and um, this actually raises some good questions. Like, um, are people, people love our milk when they have it. Like, we never really tell people our milk tastes heaps better because no one believes you because everyone says that about their product. But it, it actually does. Um, and, you know, you, you give it to teenage boys and they just hoe through it, um, double the rate of their normal consumption. So we know the product tastes good, just fresh milk that's min minimally processed. Um, but then there's a question mark, how many people are going to uh, get turned off non-homogenized milk, you know, when they open up the lid and there's a, um, a big clump of cream on the top? You know, most people who are, I suppose, 40 years, 45 years of age have never really uh, – experience milk that's not homogenized so you know there, there's a potential there that some people won't like it but um well it's a little bit of an unknown really um we've got a question here about home delivery and i haven't talked enough about home delivery we've built this really awesome home delivery system like uber eats and we just don't well, we're talking about it now. We need to show a video of how it all works, but I've got to get myself in, uh, got to get my act together and actually do it. But delivery of milk is really, really hard because if you think of Uber Eats, I think they have a minimum order of like $20. And you think of my food bag, I think they're dealing with a product that's maybe $100 at least. So that delivery fee has to be spread over a $100 item or a $20 item. When you're dealing with milk where it costs, you know, $3 or two eighty dollars or whatever we're going to sell it at, that still costs the same to really deliver it, but the value of that milk sale is quite low. So what we're wanting to do is, is have crowd-based milk delivery people. So each suburb might have one or two people who are designated the home delivery people for that suburb. Um, and when people go to their fridge and they want more milk, they just whip out their app and click the buy now button. And then whoever their milk delivery person is in that area, that suburb, gets a notification, says this person at this address wants milk. And at the end of the day, there might be, you know, 50 people who want milk. And then they'll just pop out, put the tank on their car, bike, trolley, goat, no, no not goat, donkey, whatever they've got, and they just go door to door. Um, customers will leave their milk bottles out at the letterbox. Uh, when they get there, they just the app knows where they're at. They click dispense, dispenses milk, charges the right person, it gives the home delivery person their margin, and off they go to the next one. 
So we think that that's a really efficient way of getting de milk delivered to the home. And, you know, we want to make it that it's a really good business for those delivery people. They do maybe two to three hours work a, uh, a night and get a couple of hundred dollars, you know, and that's almost a living for some people. You know, you could get seven, eight hundred dollars a week by just delivering milk. Um, we probably have to... We probably have to build everything else out first. The potential for that to go wrong is a little bit higher than having our milk in a supermarket or into a, a cafe. So we built that when we were all in lockdown and we thought maybe we'd never be able to go to a supermarket in the near future. So anyway, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, and I'll just touch on the last one. We'll be going an hour now. Um, my kids have actually been really good. Um, so Logan's asked, your valuation of 7.25 million um, when you project losses for the next four years, um, can you explain the method methodology? Um, so you basically, the, the valuation is 5.25 million um, pre-money, and then uh, if we raise 2 million, well then you basically take that 5 mil plus 2 mil in the bank, and that's the valuation. And yeah, as we said, I mean, the potential that we're building this platform, the potential to scale is quite um, quite large. We can, we're going to build this into a really big business. And I think a lot of startups are just um, basically potential. And, um, yeah, so I, uh, I, uh, I, I suppose you're investing in the promise that the team is going to execute and whether our team can execute. And uh, when and if we do execute, what's the return? So basically, the return is we're going to build a big business, and we're making ethical, well, what we believe to be ethical, sustainable dairy, a competitive um, uh, advantage for these farmers, well, basically smaller farmers around the world. So um, I will, um, yeah, I'll I'll stand behind that valuation. Um, oh, and here we have the man himself who asked that question, Logan. So delivering 400 liters a day to earn 200 for a delivery person. Oh, let me get my calculator out. Um, we have to decide whether um, how much people are going to get for the delivery. And that really depends on how much work is involved. And I think we're going to... Basically, we're, we're going to target high-dense areas, so it's basically suburbs, you know, where you've got a house, you know, five, ten metres from each other, and you go door to door. Uh, anything outside of that, if we go in rural areas, there's probably better ways for those people to buy their milk than for us to drive to them or have someone drive to them. But then again, if someone's prepared to drive to them, well... That's um, that's fine. I don't think you'd do 400 liters a day. 400 is quite a lot. Uh, I think. Uh, let me just work it out. I mean, I would say the the max someone would be doing oh, would be 200 liters, because you kind of want to do it within a two to three hour period. You wouldn't want to be going over, you know, over that. So it wouldn't be 400 liters a day. Um, but we. Um, oh, here's the next one. While filling it, yep, that's the plan. Fill it the letterbox. Um, people leave their bottles out, or maybe at the doorstep, or whatever it is, and um, you just yeah shoot up to their um, up to the letterbox, pick the bottle up, put it into our dispenser, which is mobile, and fill it up. And anyone who's got any experience with filling milk knows that it's easier said than done. Um, uh, 100 deliveries per day. What is that on the 400 liters? Well, it depends how many people. Yeah, so many variables. It depends how many people, uh, how many liters people get. But um, this is, um, yeah, we're not going to start off with our home delivery model. We've built it. It's sitting there. It's almost ready to go. Uh, we're probably going to dabble in it. Um, and and see how it goes it really comes down to demand and i, I kind of think when we've got milk dispensers easily accessible to people that home delivery actually 
isn't as convenient as we think it is. Um, but um, but you, I mean, Logan raises a point doing a whole lot of deliveries um, in a day. Uh, it, it adds up. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I need to show this. Yep. Yeah. Logan said to make $200.50 a litre. Yeah, so that, that really comes down to how many um, how many liters do you do per delivery, and and uh, what distances are travelled, and there's a whole lot of variables around that. And partly the reason we're not doing that yet is because that's true. We, we're probably going to actually put the delivery head will have three or two to three delivery heads on it, so you can fill up you know three bottles at once basically. Um, but as I said, anyone who's experienced with filling bottles accurately um, and quickly knows that it's it's easier said than done. But our, our dispenser is accurate. But um, it's it's one thing to have it accurate in in um, a cafe or a supermarket. It's another thing to have it jingling down the footpath and being accurate. But um, um, the idea and yeah, the idea is, is you know you make a hundred bucks, hundred and fifty bucks a night. Um, and do that five days a week, well, you know, that's that's good money for a lot of people. And, you know, if you can do that in their suburb, you know, so they're not traveling 20 kilometers a day, it um, becomes quite viable. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, if anyone's got any other questions, um, let's just check. I've seen a few pledges come in while we've been talking, so let's refresh there. Um, Three for few. Oh yeah, fifteen hundred. So thanks to all those um, new pledges. Um, um, so here we are. We've basically got nineteen days to go. It'd be great if we could hit our minimum before then. Uh, if anyone's got any last questions, I'm I'm happy to stick around. Um, kind of run out of things to say. Um, but you know, we're really confident about where things are at. I, I do sort of sometimes feel it's taken a lot longer than I'd hoped. Um, but, you know, when you, you know, we talk to David and Sam on the team and you look at the technology they've actually built there, it's probably hard for people to see because we're just saying, oh, we're nearly started, we're nearly there, we're nearly there, and I, I get it gets a bit monotonous and a bit boring, but uh, we actually are. And I think when you see that it rolls out, we've, we've put a lot of thought into building something that's going to be competitive in the market and make farmers competitive um because it's one thing to get what i've noticed with a lot of these smaller milk businesses around the world and i knew this before i started mine they get to about that four to five year mark and just becomes too hard and they end up quitting um and i think what we're wanting to do is make it so it's not so hard and um you know it's a lot of work um so you know, that's why we put so much time and effort into designing how we build this hub and how we process that milk and and um basically hand off a lot of the monotonous stuff or the all the labor intensive stuff like delivery milk or filling bottles we put that either into the hands of the customer where it's not such a big deal for them to s fill their own bottle or into a delivery person who's going to um you know basically make it their little their little business and if they don't want to do it it's not the end of the world you're not tied to it whereas um you know when you're a farmer and you're doing it all it's uh it's quite a burden so uh yeah well um thank you everyone for joining i appreciate um all your messages uh i don't uh, i appreciate all your questions as well and um all the support we have from our crowd is is outstanding and uh just reading your messages is really encouraging and i just thank everyone for sticking by us like i said it's taken a while but um no, i think good things take time so uh thank you very much and um if you uh yeah just keep in touch you know how to get hold of me all right cheers <laughs>